Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, a regulatory landscape, and capital markets. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining me on the desk at the NASDAQ Market Site, actually joining us remotely from Florida, we have Representative Webster Barnaby of the Florida House of Representatives, Peter Kuderman, former Chief of Policy for the State of Florida and Blockchain Policy Expert, Paul Alex Espinoza, founder of CashSwipe.com, and Rob Sin, co-founder of PayBotX. We're here to discuss how technology, entrepreneurship, and policy are converging to create scalable, inclusive, and compliant financial infrastructure within the payment space. It is great to have all of you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks. Webster, let's bring you in first. We'll bring some Florida into the New York City Times Square studio. You, you really have stood out in, in Florida's um, lawmaking initiatives to advance blockchain and crypto policy, really moving the needle and embracing financial innovation. Give us some background on that and how that could potentially influence federal infrastructure. Well, Julie, thanks for having me. Uh, Florida, as you know, has always been at the forefront of economic innovation. And our proposal to, is to create a strategic Bitcoin reserve that reflects that tradition. Uh, the goal is simple, to strengthen Florida's financial position while preparing for the realities of a 21st century economy. Now, hardworking Floridians have watched inflation erode the value of the dollar and Julie, it's our responsibility to protect taxpayers' funds from that kind of volatility. And Bitcoin, with its fixed supply of global acceptance, offers a unique hedge against inflation and gives the state a tool to diversify beyond traditional assets. So we're talking about betting the farm. The legislation caps investment at just 10% of eligible funds, making this a conservative measured approach that reflects best practices in portfolio management. Yeah, and Peter, let's talk about some of those state level policy innovation and initiatives because now you're looking at that from a national strategy perspective to really scale and create institutional engagement and a, a framework. Well, Representative Barnaby's on the forefront of making sure that Florida's there on blockchain and crypto technology. Um, but I think what we have to do is look at uh, what's going on with the Clarity Act uh, at the federal level right now because it's setting the standard for what states are able to do. Uh, it, it basically is saying that um, you'll be able to, uh, uh, the SEC and the uh, Commodities Exchange will be able to uh, regulate these things. What that does is it also pulls in uh, a formerly unregulated area uh, of all these other countries who have been uh, creating this technology, but there's no regulation at all. Uh, so President Trump did a good job of, of pushing for the Clarity Act. It, it just passed the House, still waiting on the Senate. But what it does is it clearly defines what cryptocurrencies are. It says where they fall in terms of regulation. And uh, the, the, the benefit of that is obviously consumer protections. Mm -hmm. uh, consumers should feel much better investing. And uh, as a result of that, too, it's going to increase American competitiveness. Yeah, and I would imagine, Paul, from an operator perspective within the fintech space, understanding these guardrails in the framework certainly helps to advance the market access and mobility that you're trying to provide your customers. It does, Jill. Um, coming from you know, being former law enforcement and really knowing how it is to be a startup founder in entrepreneurship, I know that a lot of business owners in the fintech industry don't really get access to it, but going ahead and creating these policies and building this trust, because that's what it is. Well, without the framework, the states don't know what to do. Exactly. So they're, they're operating on their own. Uh, now that, hopefully if the Clarity Act passes, then states will be able to step in and say, under this framework now we know what to do and, and cover the bases on the other areas that aren't covered by the SEC and by the commodities regulators. Yeah, and, and, and Rob, with that framework in place, you'll be able to scale from an operational perspective because you'll understand where compliance and, and where you need to be operating. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's a great one, Jill. Uh, so with compliance, um, you know, it's it's a big uh, piece of the payments industry, you know, so creating, you know, FinTech that also incorporates everything um, to push forward and, you know, scale, you know, in the scale in the payment space it's, it's very important. Yeah, but I also think that this kind of technology is also going to provide a competitive edge, right? It'll help with not only you know, your, your um, merchant retention, but it's also gonna imply consumer trust as well. And I think that was one piece of the puzzle that was missing to help drive this innovation forward. Absolutely, yes. So, you know, when, when you don't uh, incorporate 
the technology and, and you know, move things forward, the merchants usually fall off and you, know, you don't get good results. So making everything smooth for, for the merchants to get to the finish line is, 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 yeah. is important. And, and representative at the end of the day, I mean, this just only adds to the circular economy where the access is democratized, um, the framework and the guardrails are in place, and it just goes back into the local economy. Absolutely, Julie. Um, let me just say this, you know, blockchain actually strengthens, Julie, strengthens the public trust. And public trust is, is so important in Florida, and, and I recognize that by, uh, you know, systematically uh, running these bills uh, because of the fact that a blockchain-based system flips the assumption on its head, Julie, by making operations transparent, traceable, mm -hmm. and verifiable in real time. So for Florida, embracing this technology isn't just about efficiency. It's about setting a standard of integrity that reassures taxpayers their money is being used wisely. So we're implementing blockchain in government. It creates a future where fraud, waste, and abuse are the exception, not the expectation. Mm. Yeah, well, and which is interesting, Peter, that there is support on both sides as mm -hmm. it relates to these technologies being implemented, not just for removing um, the inefficiencies and fraud out of the system, but I also think that, uh, you know, ensuring that the U.S. remains and continues its growth as a global capital markets leader and the leader in innovation is, is part of the calculus as well. For sure. And and one private one private use case that I've seen is currently we all go, we go shopping every weekend, get our groceries, and you pay the 3% fee that comes with a credit card, or even if you're using a debit card, you're paying a 3% fee every single time, no matter what. And so what, what blockchain does and cryptocurrency does is it, it creates for a fraction of a penny mm -hmm. the ability to do those transactions. And so there's this private side use, use case where you saw banks saying, hey, we don't want anything to do with the crypto space, right? But now they're starting to trend in because it's, it's, it's boiling up again. I think artificial intelligence took our eye off blockchain and, and crypto for a little while. But, but looking back at this, now, now all of a sudden, all the banks are on board. Why are they on board? Because the Genius Act passes. Now they can have their own stable coins backed by US dollars. And, and so they want to get into that game. They want to rush in now, um, and, and in part because those 3% fees start to add up. If we really want to take down our national debt, why don't we start taking those 3% fees, bring them down to zero, because that's what crypto and blockchain do, and pay that down on our debt? Yeah, well, it's interesting too, Paul. You point out that um, the fintech infrastructure, not only is it driving market access, but it's also providing income opportunities as well. It is, and then we're, we're doing that at Cash Web, my company, is because we're actually educating folks. You know, one good point that you said, Peter, was you know the, the big banks now, are, they're trying to integrate with crypto. And the reason why is because they got exposed. Mm -hmm. They got exposed totally. and they're like, you know what? The American yeah. public, they're over here thinking, well, how can we take part of this opportunity? Mm -hmm. It's the exact same thing. There's so many different strategies that uh, consumers, but also business owners, they're not exposed to, they're not educated. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the problem here, is being able to go ahead and educate small business owners, uh, rural areas and smaller markets, so they're able to capitalize, get into the fintech industry without the big banking yeah. system. 100%. Right? Yeah, 100 percent, you know, because business owners, their overhead is, you know, skyrocketing, you know, from the landlords raising and, you know, they need to come back with something that, you know, keeps their doors open. So I think, you know, what you mentioned is is exactly what's, is go, what's going on there. I, I think what's interesting, Rob, with fintech is that the industry has been deliberate in terms of delivering solutions where there are problems that actually exist not yes. just delivering products for the sake of delivering a product. Yeah. And I think that has been um, a catalyst in addition to the framework that we're seeing to um, change the way we think about infrastructure and scalability. Yeah, definitely. You know, with restaurants, software is, is huge, right? You need, you need software to operate your business. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, a taco stand or fine dining. Creating a system or utilizing a system really, you know, ex uh, really propels your business to, you know, profiting, uh, to you know, getting your bottom line up and keeping your doors open. Yeah, um, Representative Barnaby, are there any challenges that you hear from constituents and businesses as it relates to implementing this new type of infrastructure and kind of you know rethinking the way they think about business? Well, thanks, Julie. Um, I think that the public needs to be educated uh, uh, of, of the benefits of this new technology. And you know, by us being on this program with you today on the NASDAQ, 
I think more people are going to be educated that they can trust this new blockchain system and they can trust that government can run efficiently. And as Peter said, uh, we can save the taxpayers a lot of money rather than paying that 3% fee every time they go to the, to the grocery store. We can get it down to, to less than 1% and we can reduce the national debt. There is a culmination of wonderful things with this new technology bringing uh, the entire nation into the 21st century of how we should do business from a financial standpoint. And Florida is leading the way. And I'm honored and proud to be leading the way for the great state of Florida with this technology. And the whole country is going to benefit. They're going to see that what Florida is doing is innovative. We've got a great governor, a great CFO. Um, we've just got great people who have, have come to the table to, to work towards preserving the freedoms that our founding fathers gave us. And we've got to preserve those freedoms with our financial institutions. Yeah. That's why I'm excited. Yeah, well, you know, Peter, it's interesting going back to the education part. I think understanding the audience and who you're delivering this message to is key as well. There's a different ways to speak to practitioners, policymakers, um, consumers, the communities, because you are building businesses in the communities. It does take a lot of energy for this new infrastructure to um, be developed. So I think understanding your audience and getting the buy-in that way is key to it. It's so difficult because it's not something that's so easy to explain. If, if I were to say, this is what the blockchain does, this is what the crypto uh, sphere does, maybe I would say uh, blockchain is the internet and crypto is uh, the email. It's an application of some sort uh, built on top of that. And, and for, for the average person, they, they just don't quite understand that and it's totally fine that they don't understand that. But in terms of how impactful crypto and blockchain are going to be, it's basically like if you could have invested in the internet when the internet started and you had that business for the next 20 years, how, how well would that have done? What, what would the returns on investment look like there? I think it probably would have done pretty well. Uh, we're, we're that much in the infancy and so that's why the, the investment into the knowledge, into the learning is so important because every single thing that we do in the future will be on the blockchain uh, it will it will either be decentralized or centralized. It'll be immutable or mutable. But either way, everything that we do, every transaction we do, every hotel we stay in, every building we enter, if we're using a token, uh, will be put onto the blockchain. Paul, I think part of it is too, we tend to think very US or Western centric as it relates to cryptocurrency or blockchain as an investment, as a hedge, as a speculative trade and so forth. The fact of the matter is, there are a couple billion people around the world that are using the underlying technology as a source of um, alternative forms of capital formation. If they haven't had access to banking, this is how they're able to bank, cross-border um, payment systems and so forth. So if we can apply that technology here and expand the addressable market, bring that money to the US, I mean, it, the access it provides and just understanding it's not just investing or a trading vehicle, that there's, there's utility and application here. Yeah, I think it's huge. It actually brings the world together. You know, uh, you got the payment industry you have blockchain happening. I mean, crypto is the future no matter what we see it, right? And the fact that it's getting integrated right now, Florida is leading the way. I think it's a great opportunity for the market to actually expand globally. And more people are going to want to enter the fintech industry because it's more accessible to the average person. And just like Peter was saying, uh, not everybody's going to understand the complex ways of fintech, right? It sounds scary. But when you're able to break it down and you're able to go ahead and educate folks, I think it's a massive opportunity, not only for Americans, but for everybody around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, at the end of the day, it comes back to user experience, right? Exactly. I mean, you know that with the experience that exactly. you had within this space. You, yeah. you want to get from A to B, have it feel familiar, have it be safe, and just to get the job done without caring what goes on in the back end. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, customers are, or merchants are already asking, hey, can we accept crypto? Um, so it's, it is definitely coming into the market. Um, a lot of users aren't, you know, familiar with it, um, depending on, you know, which generation you're, you're growing up. Um, but as long as we have the software moving with blockchain, business owners are, are going to love it, and more consumers can then use, use their uh, blockchain from cards that Visa is coming out with. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be really good for the global market. Yeah, I also think the ethos of the industry has changed a bit, Peter. Where it's not us versus them, but recognizing the um, ability to be nimble with a smaller startup, as an example, and then getting the scalability of incumbent players, and that the integration and improving UX 
is really what has been a catalyst in addition to the products that we've seen and the framework being put into place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I remember hearing recently that uh, we think now at this point that there could be the first billion dollar business, uh, one person business built out of AI. Uh, and that's totally going to be the case. One person with the tools that AI have can can do that um, and scale it up quickly. So it's going to be interesting to see how big business uh, combats that uh, or works with those folks uh, to, to create a more globalized economy because that's exactly what this is going to do. Yeah, well, I think the question of how AI is going to impact you know, every industry and what that's going to look like. And it's still, you know, early infancy. It's, it's, I think it's too soon to determine ROI. But, you know, to your point, um, you know, the integration is, is what's key to this. Yeah. No, and I mean, AI is already making a difference. I mean, you're seeing small operators, one man team, you know, that are able to generate easily eight, nine figures with no, no back end, no overhead expenses. And they're able to create these billion dollar companies or multi-million dollar companies. And it's just going to grow. That's all. AI is going to grow. Blockchain is going to be integrated. And it's going to be, it's going to be a fun sight to see. Yeah, we're already utilizing AI to support you know our three three thousand plus agents. Otherwise, there'll be a bottleneck. So AI has you know relieved you know the pressure there. It'll be interesting to see where the conversation is in the next, even one to three years. I would venture to yeah, say. Absolutely. Appreciate <laughs> all of your insights. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Joe Malandrino, global markets reporter at Nasdaq.